we invited Professor Alex Thomas to be with us here. Uh, over to you now. I'll give you about 40 minutes, then we will open for questions. Thank you. The outline of the lecture is as follows. I'll start off with some brief introductory remarks. I'll talk a little bit about economics today as it stands. I'll try to provide you with a context of their work and then go on to talk a little bit about their key contributions. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, how their work influences policy, something that the, the deputy uh, chief minister just mentioned. And then I'll talk a little bit about what are the limitations of their work, and I'll end with concluding comments. So anyway, this we actually know uh, that uh, C.V. Raman lectured in this hall, and he was awarded the Nobel in 1930. I actually wanted to uh, draw this, draw attention to this as a surprise, but unfortunately, Professor Jafet already spoiled my surprise by mentioning it in his uh, earlier remarks. So there's a. Another Nobel connection, which is uh, for economic sciences. In fact, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2007, and he spent, I think, his Fulbright year in at Bangalore, you know, three years at Bangalore University. So, what what is the status of economics today? Earlier, when economics started off in 1776 with the publication of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, it was a science of wealth. You wanted to understand employment, you wanted to understand poverty. Now, economics has become more a science of choice. Now, economic analysis begins with an individual. Earlier, it used to begin with social classes. Today, the dissemination of economics research and ideas are mainly through journal articles and textbooks in some sense. And nowadays, people read very less of books, I think. Uh, earlier people spend more time reading books and that's one of the ways in which it was disseminated. There's a close association with policy today and it was the same earlier too, since the 1800s. Today mathematics and physics occupy a more important position in economics learning, which is a marked departure from how economics used to be earlier and how it started off where economics was more closely associated with philosophy and politics. In fact, the, the degree there in 1920s at Oxford University was called PPE. So economics today, uh, what are the questions, what are the broad questions? I'm just giving a, a brief of the questions that interest economists today. How should competition be ensured? We have a body in India called the Competition Commission of India, which tries to ensure that competition is actually happening. How to regulate the interest rate? Many of you might be aware of the recent uh, disagreements that have been happening with the government and the Reserve Bank of India, so that is an important question. How to determine the minimum support prices? Again, a very important political question and of interest uh, to economists. How to promote employment? Again, I put a question mark there because I think that we are not doing probably enough uh, in trying to provide gainful and good employment. There's also a bigger question of how to incorporate household work, which is often unpaid work and invisible work in GDP. So having said that, I want to say a little bit about what intellectual progress means, at least with respect to economics. The main point that I would like to state is that in economics, intellectual progress has not been linear. And what I mean by that is there have been revolutions in thinking. So when we had the global financial crisis of 2007, economics of Keynes and Marx became even more important. 
So people started going back and learning them. In economics, there is a pluralism of ideas and methods. So it's not just one kind of economics that is present or prevalent, but you have multiple kinds of economics. And in terms of methods too, there is a pluralism. Uh, maybe this is a contentious point, but I think most of you would appreciate the fact that because economics is about material resources and the distribution of material resources, it is always easily amenable to ideological corruption. And this is something that one always has to be cautious about. My claim is also that economics has become a language. It is a language of policy increasingly relative to other social sciences. What is the connection between mainstream economics and the Nobel Prize? Well, the Nobel Prize technically only awards prizes to people who publish within the mainstream of the tradition. There have been exceptions, and one exception is Eleanor Ostrom, who was awarded the prize for a work on commons, or relating to environmental economics. And there are three other people who have also been awarded the Nobel Prize in different uh, contexts, but all of them have tried to challenge the mainstream of economics. So Amartya Sen, Joseph Stiglitz, and Paul Krugman. But the question is, I mean, is that all eco economics there is? And how many of us want to try and understand the kind of economics that happens in Indian universities? And what is our intellectual heritage? So I've just mentioned a list of universities here which have produced very good economists. And these are economists who have also published internationally. But yet, today in the universities, we hardly come to hear of them. We don't know what their contributions are. And we often don't even know their names. So now I move on to the context of their work. Um, I'll try and keep it as less technical as possible and try and tell a story. So these are the three important economists who were writing around the 19, um, 1930s and later. So the first person there is John Maynard Keynes. The second person is Roy Harrod. And the third person is Bob Solo, who is also a Nobel uh, laureate. So Keynes's main argument is that aggregate demand matters in the short run. So it is important to ensure there is enough demand in the economy. And if demand is not forthcoming, Keynes argued that the government needs to increase its expenditure. Harrod extended Keynes's ideas to the long run, to growth. He said that growth of aggregate demand is also important. However, Harrod said, much like Keynes, that you cannot expect everyone who's looking to be employed to find work. In other words, full employment is not guaranteed. Then comes Solo. Solo changes the equations a little bit. He uses a very different uh, theoretical framework. And he, he showed that there is a tendency to full employment. In a way, if I can term it this, so there's a move from pessimism to a certain kind of optimism. And when I say pessimism and optimism, I'm talking with connection to the market mechanism or the working of the market. So there's a second uh, connection or a story. The first person there is Frank Ramsey, who is actually a young Cambridge uh, philosopher and mathematician who unfortunately died at a very young age of 26. And the second person is Irving Fisher who's an, an important economist. So, I've mentioned. so why is uh, Frank Ramsey important? Because he developed this uh, particular model where you try to find out how much you preferred the future over the present. Or what is called optimization or intertemporal optimization. And this was something that Ramsey published in 1928. Right? So the question that we are going to be looking at when we discuss William Nordhaus's work is, whether future consumption, that is how much we, our generation consumes in the future, should be given less weightage or less importance than what we consume today. Or in other words, in the, in the parlance of economics, whether future consumption should be discounted. Irving Fisher gave us the theory of the interest rate. He argued that interest rate is like any other price which is determined in the market. So if demand is greater than the supply, the price rises. 
And in a, in a, in a bit more technical sense, he argued that interest rate reflects the society's state and technology, much like the demand and supply that most of us know. So this is a broad context of their work. This then allows us to talk a little bit about the status of growth theory, at least in the 1960s, and both Romer and Nordhaus bases their work on the growth theory in the 1960s. So the following key ideas were very well established in the literature. One, that technological progress generates growth with full employment. And I mentioned exogenous there because it was as if technological progress was coming from outside the theory. The second idea is that the interest rate that we pay is a measure of time preference. Or in other words, how much do we value the future <coughs> relative to today? That is what we mean by time preference. But this is just an additional point that the story that I told you about Ramsey, his work was not really engaged with in the growth literature when he published it, but it's only after Solo's work that people went back and looked at Ramsey's work. And this is also a bit so that all of you understand that Nordhaus's work and Romer's work did not happen in a vacuum. And all of them are standing on the shoulders of giants before them. So now I move on to their theoretical contributions. As some of you might know, at, at, if you've read the prize award, Nordhaus was awarded the prize for integrating climate change into long run macroeconomic analysis. In other words, in growth. And Romer was awarded the Nobel Prize for integrating technological innovations into long run macroeconomic analysis. So if I have to put it very broadly, they've been awarded the Nobel Prize for integrating nature or the ecology and knowledge or ideas into economics. I've added a bracket there and I've written neoclassical because as I mentioned to you before, the Nobel Prize recognizes and awards work which is in the dominant tradition which is called the neoclassical economics. And I've put a star there just to remind you that this is not the only tradition or perspective in economics. There are multiple other traditions. So this is, this I thought is an interesting quote and uh, which very well characterizes the work of Nordhaus and Romer. So I shall read this quote, quote out, which is also by a very famous uh, and important economist, Arthur C. Pigou. He writes, among persons interested in economic analysis, there are tool makers and tool users. And I'll talk a little bit about this later. So actually, Nordhaus and Romer have done both. Right? So they've developed the theory and they've also applied the tools for policy. So there's a close connection in their contributions in both theory and policy. So now let's just take a look at uh, what is Paul Romer's motivation. So at least this is what he writes, this sharp increase. What is it that for so long that we didn't have and suddenly we had, which led to a sharp increase in the per capita GDP? Again, what is per capita GDP? It is the total amount of goods and services that are produced in an economy. And if you divide it by the population, you get an idea of how much an average person can actually consume. So there's a little bit of uh, very simple uh, equations that I've put here. And by now, as I've already mentioned, Sol Solo's work was quite well known. This is a simple function which tells you the relationship between Y, which is output, and a set of inputs. A refers to something like technological progress, L refers to labor, and K refer refers to capital. So Solo's point is that if you have a growth in either of them, that is in technological progress, which is represented by A, in labor, or in capital, it would lead to an increase in output. Or in other words, we would have economic growth. So if there's a policy question, you want to increase growth, what can we do? According to Solo, you can invest more in labor, you can invest more in capital, or you can invest in technology. But in Solo's work, technological progress was exogenous. That is, he did not have an explanation for how the economy in itself or within itself would generate technological progress. So this earned the 
wrath or the scorn of John Robinson, who is another famous economist, who said that it is as if technological progress is like manna from heaven, which is a reference to the, uh, to the Bible where it seems like it's just falling from heaven and you don't have an explanation for where technological progress comes from. So Roma comes to the scene here and he actually is able to show that technological progress is created by human actions within the economy. In other words, he is able to show that technological progress is endogenous. So he is saying that it is because of entrepreneurs who are actively engaged in profit maximization that you have technological progress that is happening and it is not coming from somewhere outside the system. And from his work, he makes it very clear that it is ideas that are very essential for technological progress. So by ideas, he is really talking about basic research and development. And here I think I can go back to um, what a, de a deputy chief minister also mentioned, the importance of basic and fundamental research. It's so Romer's claim is also that if you have more ideas that are generated, which are of a very basic nature, which can then be used that is how you can actually achieve economic growth. Then Romo makes the claim that ideas have positive externalities. What do I mean by that? It means that so if I if I if I create an idea, if I create an idea, it um, it leads to it, the market is not able to really represent the idea completely, or the market is not able to price the idea appropriately. And because of that, the market fails. That is, according to uh, Romer, he would argue that the market underproduces ideas or research and development. So let's just quickly go to Nordhaus's contribution. So this again has been uh, made clear that if you have an increase in technological progress or other inputs, it would lead to an increase in growth. Nordhaus does something to the same model, he brings in energy as an input because we are consuming coal, we are using different kinds of inputs from nature and we are also generating pollution or CO2 which I think Bangalore is exceptional for. So the use of nature in production implies that it also causes global warming. Right? So this Nordhaus was able to actually talk about and in this case in Roma you had positive externalities because ideas is a good thing. In this case, you have negative externalities because the person who is polluting is not paying the price. So in this way, the market fails because the market is not able to ap appropriately price the carbon dioxide emission. So in other words, the market overproduces carbon dioxide. So quickly, if you want to uh, understand what Romer and what Nordhaus have done, both of them have in some way extended Solo's work and by the way Nordhaus's uh, PhD supervisor was Bob Solo. So whereas one person endogenizes technological progress, the other person is able to integrate <coughs> nature. Right? And as we've just seen, in one case the market underproduces ideas which have positive effects and in the other case the market overproduces carbon dioxide which have negative externalities. So I'll just uh, quickly go through this. Uh, so Nordhaus also created this model where he brought in chemistry, physics and economics to talk about uh, what would happen in an integrated setup. So using computer simulation, various paths are outlined. And this is something like many of you who uh, do optimization in mathematics or in data science, it's like a massive optimization exercise. And you have the objectives and you have the constraints, it tells you what is the growth path that you have to choose. And it also means that how much you prefer the future over today also matters. Or in other words, the discount rate matters. It's, uh, so this is a bit uh, more of detail on that, but given time, I'm just going to quickly go through that. So uh, the essential point being that there is some kind of a trade-off between what, how much we want to consume today and how much we want to consume tomorrow. And that is captured in the discount rate. So if you actually value both present and future equally, our discount rate would be zero. Ro Nordhaus also talks about indirect reduction of uh, climate change through investment in education, in medicines and technology. 
So what are the immediate policy implications? One, as we have seen, the market underproduces ideas. So therefore, Roma suggested that we need to incentivize the creation of research and development. That is, you can give research and development subsidies, you create patents. So in effect, the government must somehow create an additional market for ideas. So the market has failed in one, so you create an additional market in the other. The market overproduces carbon dioxide, so you disincentivize carbon dioxide emissions. This can be through some kind of carbon taxes or carbon credits. So Pigo also mentioned this in 1920s that polluters must pay. So in effect, the government must create an additional market for pollution. So the broadly, if you want to characterize this, both their aim is to internalize the externalities. So in a way, the optimism of the solo model in the market mechanism continues unabated. So what are the, so I just didn't want to stop with their policy uh, implications. I thought it's always useful when we have ideas which are probably con conflicting to each other. So this is a recent book which is published in 2016 where she argues that governments also produce value, right, and not just the market which means that governments can actively invest in research and development and not just incentivize the market to do so. This is another book also uh, coincidentally published in 2016 by Sam Bowles where he argues that it's not just monetary incentives that matter. We work in societies, we work in communities, trust matters, goodwill matters. How do we ensure that it's not just money that matters and how do we create a society which is not entirely built on monetary incentives. So who decides climate policy? So Nordhaus would argue that how much of current GDP should be devoted to climate change? That is a question and it is sensitive to the discount rate. The discount rates can be set in multiple ways. So another important economist, Nicholas Stern, he did not win the Nobel Prize. Actually uh, William Nordhaus in his uh, speech that he gave actually expressed surprise that Nicholas Stern did not win the Nobel Prize because Stern has a different view of how immediately we should uh, engage with climate change policies. So who decides it? In a way the market and again I've been told that uh, I have about five minutes left so I'm going to go uh, at least quickly go through this uh, without addressing it. But also the question is what is the role for non-conventional economists? And what is the role for true democratic politics? Should the discount rate be completely left to economists or should we have other social scientists and other scientists having a role in choosing the discount rate? And uh, this is also a recent book uh, where, I mean, this is a book which is critical of economists because, uh, or he talks of what are, what are the perils of leaving economics to the experts. So this is quickly to talk about, I mean, just uh, give a sense of, so if you don't do anything, what will happen to carbon-2 emissions over time is on the top green side. And if you choose the orange one, which is a stern recommendation where your discount rate is close to zero, it means by 2040 we are going to drastically reduce carbon dioxide emissions. But of course the important thing to remember here is that we are only reducing the flow. All that has already been accumulated, we have to have different ways of reducing the stock of those emissions. So quickly I'll go through the policy lessons for India. I think that research and development is important. But of course there's a question of patents uh, which we give in emerging countries versus advanced countries because they have more capital and they're able to give patents much more easily. In fact, there's a whole issue of over patenting in the West, especially in pharmaceuticals. And this um, is interesting quotation that I, I mean, um, it is actually from Karl Marx, um, one of his earlier writings where he talks of competition is the cunning right of the stronger. I wanted to mention this because even if we, in India, if we want to give it, if there are other countries who are competing and they are much economically stronger, we might lose out. So international relations also becomes important. What about traditional knowledge? I think that it's important that we conserve traditional knowledge too. Public spending in higher education, as anyway, everybody in this room knows, I think it's extremely important. And public spending in basic research, not just in the sciences, but also social sciences and humanities. So in a way, 
the policy lessons that I've drawn here are more Mariana Mazzucato's than Paul Romer's. I think the environment is important, but recently some of these acts have been diluted. So there's an urgent need for good environmental policy. And we must also take into account slow ecological damage and not just take into account which are huge in nature. And this is much more invisible and it requires much more concerted vision. And of the very important thing of self-governance of commons, Bangalore has a lot of commons, especially its lakes. How do we take care of them? And I think that uh, we probably, I mean, we need to be very serious about disaster management too with all the, I mean, the recent floods that Kerala saw. And climate change in a way is a global public good which affects everyone. So how do we have international organizations that can somehow help with this? So I think I'm going to quickly go over and uh, not engage with the criticisms much. Uh, we have just mentioned this, uh, that interest rate is, I mean, there's a strong critique of this, that interest rate is not about time preference. As many of you know, that interest rate is actually set about our demand for liquidity. And this was a point that Keynes mentioned in 1936. And when you have fundamental uncertainty, it's very difficult to decide the discount rate appropriately. And we can also have, even if there's technological progress, there could be a problem of aggregate demand deficiency. And as I mentioned before, what is the role of non-monetary incentives? And how is value created? Value is also created by the government and not just the market. Therefore, the government should have a more integral role in the economy. And the choice of discount rate these are criticism external to economics. I think it's a political decision too. And I think the problem with monetary compensation is that sometimes you cannot just compensate for the loss in diversity, sorry, biodiversity. That is, if you lose a lake in Bangalore, you cannot build a lake elsewhere in the country and say that you've compensated for it. The nature of technological progress uh, in a labor surplus country like India is something that we need to take into account. And as I mentioned, uh, tech traditional knowledge is also important. And as many ecologists are arguing, is there a limit to growth? So what are the broad conclusions? I think Nordhaus and Romer have been successful in integrating nature and ideas into growth theory. They have internalized the externality and they believe that creating additional market enabled by the government is a policy. The question is how novel they are. Since I work in the history of economic thought, I cannot but go back to Adam Smith, who wrote in the 1776, who very much spoke about the importance of technological progress in economic growth, <coughs> and to David Ricardo, who wrote in 1817, who spoke about the, the problems caused by natural scarcities, which would lead to decreasing returns. So Nobel Prize recogni recognizes contributions to mainstream economics and other traditions are not really engaged with. I think we need to have a greater dialogue with other scientists and social scientists. And I think the role of criticism and knowledge is very important because an idea grows in the presence of other competing ideas and the government also should play an important role. And this is the last slide. So I think Indian economic thinking is very important and I think as teachers and students, we need to engage more with Indians who have thought seriously about Indian economic policies and have also contributed internationally to them. I've just mentioned some names here. They're not exhaustive or representative. And I think as uh, students and as uh, practitioners in India, we have probably three kind of burdens. We not only have to engage with mainstream economics, but also non-mainstream economics and Indian economics. So, in a way, our job is much more difficult than, than those who are probably teaching and researching in the West. And ideas and context both matter for policy. And finally, I think that a good knowledge of history of ideas, plus ideas, plus good policy and good politics, I think is essential for a good life for all. Thank you. Alex Thomas to take this. Yeah, there you are. Can't hear me. Uh, any questions that you have for Dr. Thomas? State your name and where you come from, your institution. 
mics, please. You should go. Okay. Uh, very good evening to one and all. I am Dr. Nirmala from Kendra Bank School of Management Studies, Bangalore Central University. Uh, my question is when you are talking about one of the slides, you have mentioned about the household work can be included in the GDP of the country. So how we can include, one point, if you are, how long it takes? So, so, sorry, can you how long it takes? The second, how we can include the household work in the GDP of our country, because GDP is talking about only quantitative terms of goods and services produced in the country, right? Uh, if it is yes, how long it takes from now to add that household work in the GDP of the country? a couple more questions before we request Dr. Thomas to speak. Little closer to the mic, please. You have to hold the mic closer. Okay. Um, I teach in this university. Um, as a social work person, we are interested in uh, how to um, give more importance to informal economy and how to integrate it with formal economy. Come again, integrate? Integrate informal economy okay. with the formal economy because now informal economy is uh, propping up the formal economy. My name is Niranjan Katsri. Uh, water is a big problem, not only in Bangalore, across the country, and we are a water stress country. Uh, are you giving any input to government of India on water policy so that we have something called Bureau of Water Efficiency set up in the country in lines of Bureau of Energy Efficiency? Because Bureau of Energy Efficiency helped us to reduce about 10,000 megawatt of energy eight years back. The same principle is applied to water the water should come in the annual reports of various companies. Today, and my, my water footprinting exercise is not being done. That's number one. And I think it's very important that a country needs to have a carrying capacity work done by uh, each city before the work starts. Otherwise, we'll have more of Kerala and Chennai in future. Thank you. Uh, so, so I had a... Is there an optimum economy? If so, what are the parameters you know, involved and how to alter those parameters so that we reach an optimum economy? related to the work done, when you said you're factoring in climate change, what exactly are you factoring? Rate of change, temperature increase, global warming, what aspect of, because it's very difficult to quantify climate change, so what aspect of climate change, how did you factor it into an equation? So it's a question of how do, how do you quantify climate change? about market overproducing CO2, and you mentioned that there's a market weight for CO2 right now. How efficient is that? And like, after applying that market weight for CO2 production, maybe like uh, your emission test and all of that, how efficient has it been from the time of application of that till now? Like, you know, is it useful? I think the advantage of being on stage is that, um, I mean, I don't know everything or I don't know all the answers to the questions you've asked. So I'll try and um, try and explain it in whatever little I know. And I must also say that I'm not an environmental economist. I think there's been uh, a miscommunication there. I work in macroeconomics and the history of economic thought, so I'm interested in that. Okay, I'll start with the first question. 
how to uh, integrate household work into GDP. So one easy way of doing it is you have a measure called imputing value. So we know that uh, we, pay household, we pay workers who come and work in the household a certain wage. So all we have to do is that you impute that into the work that we would do in the household in the same way. Uh, as to how much, how long it takes, I think uh, uh, this is a political matter and it also depends on how quickly the statistics can evolve to integrate that. Um, the question about integrating formal and informal economy, I think that's uh, much more difficult and probably the only response that I can give is that if we were to extend our labor law, in our, for instance now today I think um, domestic work is not covered by labor law. Whereas domestic work occupies a huge proportion of employment today. So how can we extend the labor law such that it takes into account or it formalizes informal work? So that's one direct way. And some of the other ways are maybe through introducing uh, GST and things like that. That's Well, I think I'm a bit reluctant to comment on that, but uh, I'm not so sure about uh, demonetization because I think it has worked probably adversely on uh, the informal sector. Uh, the other question about, um, I think that yours is more of a comment and what you wanted to make about uh, carrying capacity, but uh, the question, the first one was to do with uh, what companies do. Right. So, okay, so I actually don't know. I mean, yeah. Um, I might want to add here that one of the things that we have suggested in this document that we have offered to the uh, GCM today is to see that we are able to map not just the carrying capacity of water, but also the nexus between water and energy. For example, if this session today was held in the air-conditioned hall of the Yarrigurthy Auditorium, for then there is 80 CR of air conditioning for that auditorium. That means that we are spending about 120 units for every hour of air conditioning that space. And at a 10x on CNG and losses on AC and DC and sustenance, we are talking about 1,200 units for every one hour of running that air conditioner. Now, the air conditioner, unfortunately, does not run only on energy. It also runs on water. Now, if I were to talk of farming, for instance, and the minister here is, is, is actually from plant physiology and such, what happens is we are talking actually energy when we are drawing water for cultivation. Now, cultivation water accounts for actually 70% of all water that we consume. I know that cities are today becoming such monstrous, you know, are assuming such monstrous proportions when it comes to consumption of water and energy. But I take your point that we must study, and uh, well, the Bureau of Water and, and uh, uh, shall we say Bureau of Water Efficiency, like the Bureau of Energy Efficiency, maybe the Karnataka State Government. If you, if you actually look at this exchange itself, you'll see how, at its quintessence, <coughs> if we do get to managing the establishment of a center of excellence here, we will be able to bring some direction, is my hope. So now I realize why I've got all the wrong questions, because I think many of you assume that uh, I'm an ecological economist. So I think, uh, I, th I think the question that you asked about optimum economy is also connected to that. But uh, yeah, so I, as an economist, I'm a bit reluctant to uh, make very quantitative statements on these matters because I really think that, again, what is necessary for Bangalore city might be very different parameters from what is uh, maybe for Darbar or in different places. So I think that the decision making in some ways have to be more localized or more decentralized and the parameters are also have to be evolved from more local self-governance. I mean, I, I mean that, that is a kind of broad uh, response that I can give, but I don't have any technical uh, responses to give. Uh, so I, I think the, the how is CO2 again uh, measured? So I think that a little, bit from whatever little I know, I think that so some is that CO2 is, ex yeah. So so climate change is also partly you take into account CO2, and there are there was one slide which I quickly went over. So you take some phys physics aspects of it, what is the energy lost and conserved, or you take some chemical processes, uh, so something of that kind. And the last question was, um, 
this introducing a market for CO2, how effective has it been? I'm not so sure how effective it has been because again what it meant is people who are polluters and people who have money to pay, they have been able to buy the carbon credits. Right? So, I mean, in a sense it is uh, ensured that polluters continue to uh, pollute because they have enough money to pay. 